From the Alvin and Rosalie Sarachek Studio, PBS Kansas presents Kansas Week. Kansans weighing in on the presidential race already with their pocketbooks. What does that tell us about their voting plans? Plus, one pack to unite them all. The governor wants to bring moderate Republicans and Democrats into one happy family, sort of. And the battle over abortion regulations heads back to the courtroom. What's the argument about this time? That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. This is Kansas Week and I'm your host, Pilar Pedraza. Is the Women's Right to Know Act forcing doctors to spread inaccurate medical information? That's the contention at the core of the latest lawsuit over abortion restrictions in Kansas filed just this last June. Well, both parties laid out their arguments in the courtroom, but the judge decided that he needs more time to make a final decision. Now, abortion providers requested the temporary injunction of the Women's Right to Know Act amid an ongoing legal battle. The act, established in 1997, includes time restrictions before getting an abortion. One of the restrictions says that a doctor can't provide an abortion until 24 hours after providing state-mandated information. The latest amendment to the act says that that information includes telling patients a medication abortion can be reversed. Providers argue it's not based on science but Republican state officials believe it's accurate. A woman isn't able to functionally exercise her decision one way or the other. That's when you have a strict scrutiny problem. But simply giving a woman information, just like these abortion providers have done for 26 years, that's not impairing a woman's right to choose to have an abortion one way or the other. You cannot access abortion care except in a few parts of this country. And for us right now, we feel compelled to give patients who are going to get back in the car for 15 hours medically accurate information because we know they're scared to talk to providers at home. We want them to know they can trust us with real information. In June, abortion providers filed a lawsuit challenging the latest amendment that passed this year. The judge says he'll be making a decision on the temporary injunction request soon. In the meantime, both parties are also looking at setting an official trial date. And we'll be tracking this case and keeping you updated with the latest information. For now, reporting in Johnson County, I'm Rebecca Chung. Here to take up this and other questions from the last week, we've got Trace Saltzbrenner from the Wichita Beacon, State Representative Jason Probst, a Hutchinson Democrat, and State Representative Barb Wassinger joining us by Zoom, a Hayes Republican. Thank you all so much. And Barb, since we got you up, I'm going to start with you. I, I don't think this lawsuit is a surprise to anyone, really. No, but I think uh, what they're basically arguing against is challenging the provision that protects women from coercion. It also is interesting that they want to make sure that they get everyone from out of state because it's, it, it, let's be honest, abortion is a high dollar, high profit business. So I find it very um, disingenuous that they're arguing this and I think it hurts women. And it's, if you take the first pill for the medical abortion, there is proof that you, if you don't take the second one, you have a chance of, of going back and having the baby. And it's in, and it's in medical records. So I, I'm just not so sure that they're being as honest as they, they want to be. What about thoughts here at the desk? Uh, any surprises, Jason? No surprises. Um, you know, I remember the first time that the abortion reversal legislation came to the House. Uh, there was an effort to also include language that said this procedure to reverse an abortion is not accepted or acknowledged as valid medical practice by any uh, established medical organization, not taking it away, not changing the law, just providing additional information, and that was rejected. I believe that a lot of the conversation around abortion is disingenuous. I don't believe that abortion itself is a, as, as high dollar of a industry as the politics of abortion, which funnels tons of money into politics every single year. I think if we were actually talking about how to reduce abortion, we'd be talking about how to increase contra contraception, and we would stop pretending that men don't have a role in pregnancies. And I know, Trace, as we talk about this, you and I have been covering the politics around a lot of this, and I don't think really as Jason said, any surprise that there's been another lawsuit? We all saw this coming after last summer's vote and with the increase in the out-of-state abortions because of, what, because of what happened with Roe v. Wade and what's going on in other states around us. Yeah, you've seen a lot of the states around us go and like have trigger laws come into effect. As soon as Roe v. Wade was overturned, you've had people 
Um, well, states come in and create new laws as it goes. Kansas was able to have that historic vote, lots of turnout that was able to keep abortion access within the state, which does make it to where a lot of people from out of state come here, they're seeking abortion care. Um, and, you know, something I was looking back at that legislative session too, I believe they also said that sometimes the reversal after the pill can be medically dangerous. Mm -hmm. That is something that wasn't included in the final update. So um, there's, a, there's a lot that's going into it and I'm not surprised that out of state support has come from it because so many people are coming here, even into Wichita, because we have, I think, two different centers that see a lot of people looking for abortion care. So that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, whether you're for abortion uh, rights or against them as the case may be, Barb, I really, as we look at that out of state influx of folks coming in, adding urgency to the entire issue. I'm not sure that I agree with that. I think it's very sad that we've become a, a destination for killing babies. And, and it's, it's a very sad state of affairs for the state of Kansas. And I think we need to give people more information instead of less. We continually have people fighting against more information for women and, and helping them make good, sound decisions for them. Jason? Well, I think information is one thing, but this, this informed, uh, you know, Women's Rights No bill is where you end up with a lot of, I would just call it trickery. This is where the 12 point font shows up. This is where um, we're just doing a bunch of mechanics. We're not, most of our conversations in this state around abortion are not authentic. We're not actually talking about how to reduce abortion. We're creating a bunch of gimmickry to try to create barriers to abortion. And we're avoiding the topic altogether, which is that there are economic issues that affect abortion. There are stability issues that affect abortion. And we are not having those conversations. We're not actually having the conversation that needs to be had because we're talking about font size. We're talking about information that is not valid. And we're putting all that stuff into legislation and making a lot of barriers and a lot of bureaucracy when, and it does nothing to actually address the underlying issue, which is a serious issue that I think people in the state care about. Well, this is a case obviously still making its way through the court system. It will be back at this desk sooner or later. So we're going to move on. Is the governor tired of battling it out with the legislature over what bills should become law? This last week, she launched a political action committee designed to loosen the policy grip of conservative lawmakers in Topeka. The Kansas Reflector reports Laura Kelly called the PAC a bipartisan effort to elect moderates to both the House and Senate in Topeka. She made the announcement during a podcast recorded with the Reflector. She's calling it the middle of the road PAC. Kelly told the Reflector initiatives to fully fund K-12 public schools, implement a 10-year state transportation program or build job opportunities through economic development were accomplished through bipartisan compromise at the State House. The challenge, she said, was convincing legislative majorities to fairly consider change popular among Kansans based on polling by Fort Hayes State University, including expansion of eligibility for Medicaid. Kelly said the legislature would better serve the state's 2.9 million residents by involving more moderates in forming, debating, and voting on key issues. The influence of centrist GOP lawmakers in Kansas has diminished since 2012 when Republican Governor Sam Brownback helped finance conservative candidates who successfully challenged moderate incumbents. Movement to the political right was most profound in the Kansas Senate. Republicans hold two-thirds majorities in the House and Senate, a mathematical reality frustrating to Kelly. All 165 seats are up for grabs in 2024, and the government would flex her PAC's financial muscle in the August primary and November general elections. And Kelly, who dispatched GOP challengers Chris Kobach and Derek Schmidt in back-to-back -back campaigns, cannot seek re-election in 2026. As a, and as was referenced in the Reflector article, you know, this isn't the first time we've seen a governor kind of flex their muscles and try to influence a an election. We all saw that in 2012. I'm very excited. I hope that <laughs> I hope that she can find a moderate Republican who can win an election because historically in the last several years since 2012, we've not had a big crop of moderate Republicans who can win. And frankly, I think the state's been better served when we had some division among the Republican uh, caucus. 
Uh, right now, they have this supermajority. I jokingly, and kind of not jokingly, tell people, uh, any problem that you have in the state of Kansas, anything you're unhappy about, you should blame Republicans, because there's only been three times in the state's history the Democrats have had control of the legislature. So Republicans have a monolithic control of this governing body. This is where bills come from. This is where tax policy comes from. And conservative Republicans have a stranglehold on it. I don't know that she'll find a moderate Republican who can win an election, but I'm sure encouraged by it and hopeful. Barb, what do you think? Is there a moderate Republican out there uh, who could win an election against a conservative right now in Kansas? <clears throat> I, I have no way of making that statement, but I can tell you that it is every governor that's up against uh, the inability to re run for office starts a pack. And Brownback did it, Sebelius did it, Laura Kelly's doing it. It's it's not unusual. And and you throw money at what you think will work best. And and that's I, I'm I'm concerned about middle of the road people because what you, happens when you walk down the middle of the road is you get hit by a car. You know, sitting on the fence does not help Kansas. We need people that are decisive and people that can um, continue to put Kansas in their best interest. So, colleague is, is not happy with that because he's not in the majority. But if, if it was flipped the other way, I think um, he would think it was fine. No it's doubt. If it were flipped the other way, I agree with Barb. If it were flipped the other way, she would think it was fine, no doubt. As we look specifically at the Senate, because that's really kind of where a lot of the sticking points have been, one vote comes to mind this last session. It was a veto override that failed by one vote because of a moderate Republican. And from everything I've heard, she's being targeted as well. So, you know, this maybe provides her some backup support. Hey, I mean... When I talk to people here locally, especially involved in local politics, I get a lot of people saying that they're tired of how politicized, divergent, like completely on opposite sides of the road people are over at the state house, and they want to see some <laughs> some cooperation and support when it comes to local services. You know, we have a lot of local leaders here within Wichita who've been able to kind of cross that party line a little bit, been able to work together for a few different things. Um, the homelessness task force is the one that comes to mind as you know someone who reports a lot on homelessness here within Wichita. That has bipartisan support. It has two people on opposite sides of the party working together. And they have both expressed that, like, there's frustration when they want support. It's not going to come from the state house because it is so politicized, so divergent right now over there on that side of things. No. Well, and Barb, uh, talking about the politicization, uh, we talk about the kind of the controversial issues from the state house here a lot, but we also talk about the fact that uh, the majority of the time, the different parties all vote together. Oh, and the majority of the time in the legislature, and I think Jason would agree with me, the majority of questions that come before us are nonpartisan. It's, it's just more of the hot ticket items that we disagree on. So saying that we haven't worked by, as bipartisans, we have. Um, there are just the majority opinions that we disagree on. So... I want to assure Kansans that we are getting along, and I actually, I, I actually really like my colleague and uh, enjoy hearing from him. Even though we have completely different ideas about things, we do both have families, and we both know that we care about uh, each other as people. And and so, when I hear people say it's it's super partisan and politicized, I think that that's an unfair statement. All right. Anything to add before we move on? No, I think, I mean, Barb's right. We, on an individual level, we do get along. A lot of us get along in the state house. And we do, uh, if, if we recognize people, and I think this is actually something we could use more of in politics, is to acknowledge our humanity, that we are people at the core of this. We have different ideas. Um, but I think there is a real concern when you have some sort of group think that takes over and those turn into policy decisions and there's not room for dissenting ideas or opposition ideas because I think you get your best ideas when people are uh, focused on solving problems and they're open-minded and they have their, their hearts and their minds open to new ideas. All right. Well, from the State House to the White House, the Wichita Eagle this week reporting more conservative Kansans are making DeSantis their choice. 
The Wichita Eagle reports Ron DeSantis held high-dollar fundraising luncheons in Wichita and Kansas City this week as he tries to close the financial and electoral gap between himself and former President Donald Trump. The Eagle says among the attendees were big-name Wichita conservatives, including Charlie Chandler, CEO of Entrust Bank, Dave Murphan, Steve Clark and his son Stephen, leaders of Clark Investment Group, Todd Lair, president of Leading Technology Composites, and Adam Barron, president of Barexco. The Eagle says a Wichita real estate broker, Herb Krumsick, confirmed he and his wife attended the fundraiser, saying DeSantis impressed them. Because he's in Florida, we didn't have a real good feel for him. The Eagle quotes Krumsick as saying, but he was everything I would have hoped for, adding, he's a gentleman. What you see is what you get. He's really a stand-up guy, and I can see why they love him in Florida. According to the FEC, Kansans have already donated a total of $414,202 to various presidential campaigns. The most, more than $218,000, has gone to Donald Trump. Ron DeSantis comes in second, having raised nearly $66,000 in Kansas as of his last filing. So some interesting numbers there, and I'm going to ask each of you the same question here. What sticks out the most about this story? Trace, I'm going to start with you. Well, it's going to be bringing it back to the mayoral election we have here in Wichita. Uh, Stephen Clark, that is the partner, uh, the boyfriend of one of our mayoral candidates, um, Lily Wu, who is, to, is now one of our last two candidates. She actually got the most votes in our primary. Um, so looking at that, you know, that connection there, we also saw that Lily Wu had fundraising from the Americans for Prosperity, which is a uh, Koch foundation. So. Uh, Mostly what I'm looking at is where are these ties, where are they going, what does that play into when her policies that she's talking about, and we see a lot of chatter about that connection that she has to Stephen Clark, real estate development, and where that might be going. But that's mostly what stands out to me when I read this story. Very Wichita-centric, Carissa <laughs> Fonts. Jason, wait, what stands out most to you? What stands out to me is that it's no surprise that the wealthiest people in this area support the corporate uh, version of Trump. Uh, the question will be whether the populist, the populist voters that voted for Trump the last two elections will uh, vote for diet Trump in DeSantis, and I don't think that's going to happen. All right. Barb, what about you? What stood out the most for you out of uh, that story? I have no idea how it's going to end up. I know that a lot of people like Trump and a lot of people like DeSantis, so just like with the um, uh, Democratic decisions coming up for the governor's mansion, uh, you're going to have people on both sides. So I know that the biggest thing that Ron DeSantis has had going for him is how he handled things during COVID and, and opened things up much faster. So uh, I think he's he's got a chance, but we'll see when, when the election comes. I know one thing that uh, a lot of folks think about here when they think about all of these is that, okay, we've got a lot of numbers, but numbers don't always, as you kind of hinted, Jason, translate into votes. And we actually are having a vote this year, sort of. It's a non-binding vote, but we are having a presidential preference uh, primary this year or next year. Yeah, well, <laughs> this next major presidential election, let me be clear. Well, it's going to be very interesting to watch. Like you said, you know, support doesn't always equal dollars. We also have, you know, indictments coming down for Donald Trump. We don't know how that's going to affect later on as it continues. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a bunch of support for him right now, especially in this area amongst, you know, Republicans in Wichita. And I'm really interested to see where does that shift go? Does it go to DeSantis? Does some other third person pop up that's going to get that vote? And you know, that upcoming election may give us a little taste of where that's going to go. And uh, I'll be watching it closely just because it's very interesting right now where everything may play out. As will I. <laughs> <laughs> the city of Lawrence is dropping the bag, plastic bags that is, and ordering everyone else in town to follow suit. The Lawrence City Commission this week decided to begin banning single-use plastic bags on March 1st of next year and to encourage consumers to rely on cloth or other reusable bags. Saying the one-and-done sacks pollute the environment and are tossed by the millions into landfills. The 3-2 to two decision Tuesday by the commission would apply the regulation to owners and operators of businesses providing customers with disposable plastic bags to carry merchandise, food and beverages, among other goods. Ordinance number 99 96 included exemptions for plastic bags designed to prevent food contamination or to shield from the weather items such as clothing or newspapers. 
The city's definition of reusable bag, whether made of cloth, fiber, plastic, or other materials, required it had to be designed for repeated application. If based on plastics, an acceptable reusable bag for commercial purposes under this ordinance must contain at least 40% recycled content and measure at least 4 mils in thickness. Violators of the new ban could face fines ranging from $100 to $500 per offense, but the current city budget didn't include funding to hire an enforcement officer. This move comes after a bill blocking local governments from regulating single-use plastics failed in the Kansas Senate this year. Text of the Lawrence Ordinance says residents of the city used and discarded an estimated 29 to 36 million single-use disposable plastic bags annually. And Barb, I'm going to start with you on this one. Uh, the last two years in a row, we've had Republican efforts to ban what would essentially be plastic bag bans. <laughs> a plastic bag ban ban? <laughs> Do we see no, that coming back it. now? Uh, very possibly. I, I think we need to think about the fact that the reason why a lot of those plastic bags came into being is because they save a lot of money for businesses. They're cheaper. So now we have high inflation we are trying to force people to handle how they run their own business. And as a, sing, as a uh, business owner myself, I'm, I don't approve of that. I think we need to allow people to make the decision. And as you said, there's no enforcement of this. So is this, does this mean that people in Lawrence are going to uh, rat on their, <laughs> on their neighbors? I mean, who knows? It just sounds like it's going to be a bigger problem than they think. A definitely a very interesting issue here. And we know home rule is something that tends to come up against legislative initiatives all the time, certainly coming into play here. The beautiful irony uh, in the state house is that the same people who constantly scream that the federal government overreaches and we have to restrict the authority and the reach of the federal government I guarantee you this session, just as they have the last two sessions, will come in guns blazing, screaming that the city of Lawrence does not have a right to decide for itself what it wants to do. And it will put out legislation uh, and probably uh, it'll have some legs under it this year. Last year there was a 12 line piece of legislation that basically would have banned every city, every county in this state from regulating any business that wasn't explicitly governed by the state of Kansas. I can't think of a more big government move than to tell every city that you can't do anything unless the state of Kansas tells you. And the irony of that, I just want people to sit with that, that these are the people that say we don't like big government and they're gonna reach down and tell small government, the smallest level of government, what they can and can't do. The truth around plastic bags is not buying plastic bags will save companies a lot of money. And people will adapt, and they do. And what businesses have found is that they actually can sell branded bags that increase their advertising, actually increase their profitability. People get used to the idea of it, and they enjoy it. If we believe that states are the laboratories of democracy at the federal level, then we have to believe that cities are the laboratories of democracy at the state level and let them experiment and see what happens. And if those cities don't like it, they will replace those city council members with people who will change that law. And that happened in Pittsburgh, Kansas a number of years ago where they tried to do something similar and that city council was replaced. Democracy works if it's allowed to work. If the state intervenes and tries to overstep its authority, it won't work. And we also know that plastic bags are a problem. We, we had an issue here in Wichita where they, were the, they had a commission, a task force looking into them. And I did an investigative piece where we tracked what happens to these plastic bags that you think you're recycling. You drop them off at the big box stores to recycle and guess what? They ended up in landfills, yep. except for one that ended up in Malaysia. Yeah, <laughs> which <laughs> wild to begin with, but oh yeah. <laughs> and luckily there's been some changes here to recycling locally. Like now there's a way that you can recycle without having to clean everything that goes into recycling. Hopefully that would help in a way. I don't see much support for something like this coming to Wichita right now. Um, I in feel fact, like, we've been told by the city council it's not happening. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I, there's other things that they're working on right now. It just doesn't seem like it's going to come here, no. but it's an interesting idea. Um, I know that there's problems and some iffy numbers with like, I think, NPR did a report that was like, you'd have to use it 10,000 times before plastic use reusable bag becomes pro like it becomes viable option. So 
we'll, we'll see how it plays out, but I don't think it's going to be coming here no. locally anytime soon. Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of cities across the state that are considering it, and they're going to be watching Lawrence for a while. Mm -hmm. See what happens. Well, finally today, from small towns to the Wichita Metro, police across the state say they've seen the use of security cameras explode, and they're trying to take advantage of that in pursuing criminals. Wichita police say with the general public's increased access to high quality surveillance systems, people are investing in the technology to protect their homes and businesses. And more cameras means more evidence, as well as more work. KSN reports the Norton Police Department has upgraded to a system that includes new body cameras and new software to exchange videos. The software allows citizens to register their personal surveillance cameras and police can see who has them on a map. If something happens, they can check the map and see if there are any cameras in the area, then reach out to ask for any video from when the crime happened. Norton police say the system is reducing time on the street significantly. All right, so some interesting information there. A case perhaps of law enforcement uh, crime finding techniques finally catching up with technology? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I do like in the story it noted that this is not you connecting your camera to the police. <laughs> As the first is, question I got from everybody. Right, this is <laughs> you just saying you have a camera and the police are able to come and see that and be like, okay, this person has a camera, a crime happened here, maybe there's something on their camera. Mm -hmm. It is not connecting you to the police. Um, other than that, I think it could be a good way to kind of lower out that time that they need to knock on doors, find out where the information is. Wow. Perhaps something the legislature might uh, consider in the future, or is Maybe. it something purely left up to police departments? I think largely left up to police departments. There may be some effort to kind of incentivize it in, at the local level, um, but I think it's a good organic way to, to build a community response to crime. Uh, and I think adapting to new technology, a lot of times people are afraid of it and they, they, they get a little freaked out by it. But I think uh, you can buy a blink camera online for next to nothing and everybody I know has one of those. And so I think anything that, that connects a community and says, hey, it's, it's kind of the modern equivalent of a neighborhood watch or we're all looking out for each other. Or there's somebody, when I was a kid, it was some, uh, somebody that stayed at home all day. And if I took a different route to school, she'd call my mom and tell me about it. It yeah. doesn't seem like it's much different than that. <laughs> Barb, we've got about 30 seconds left very quickly. Your thoughts, I don't know about Hayes, Wichita, lots of concerns about rising crime, perhaps one way of dealing with that. It, obviously it would be, um, and how it's handled is another issue, but really quickly, I want to tell you, uh, after ha having been on the, um, the IT committee for the state, one of the problems that they're seeing is all of these video cameras and t uh, doorbells don't have firewalls, and they are seeing a rise Uh, okay, I think we've lost Barb's audio and we are out of time anyway. So with that, I will thank everybody, Trace, Barb, and Jason for joining us this week. We'd also like to thank our new sponsors at Cake News, the Wichita Eagle, and KSN News for sharing their materials with us. If you'd like to continue the conversation, just look for us on social media. For now, stay safe and have a great week.